Hello, uh, I'm Lucas. I work for Google. Uh, small legal disclaimer, I'm not a representative of the company, so whatever I say might or might not be aligned with what the company company's opinion is. Uh, but yeah, uh, my job uh, is in the Eng product department, which uh, includes a lot of talking to people, a lot of working with people, and the content of the talk is mostly based up on the debt, and not only within my experience within Google, but also uh, previous employments, as well as talking to a lot of people on the outside. Um, so what I've heard quite a lot is that people claim to have a release process that looks roughly like that. So in the beginning, you do a day or two of planning. You come up with the perfect plan, so you keep working until in the end, uh, could be a year with an annual release, could be a shorter time frame. Uh, so the numbers are more or less made up. Um, in the end, you have a working release. You celebrate that, of course. Um, but yeah, there's no change in between. There's no delays. There's no external impact. Um, so roughly, the idea is nice. But usually, if you draw a more realistic picture, um, it ends up looking more like that. And the text might be too small to read, but that's not that important. So roughly, you have a lot of external impact. Uh, you change your scope. Um, you might have people leaving or join the team, and you need to accommodate for that. Um, but yeah, again, the numbers are made up. Those changes can happen any day. Uh, um, the problem is, usually, you don't change your release time uh, date. So you end up with scope that might be way larger than what you initially anticipated for. Uh, but you still have the same amount uh, of time to work on it. So roughly, even if your plan was really good in the beginning, you turned your plan into an arbitrary deadline that will most likely not hold. And roughly, the face of your developers might change a bit and end up with a uh, close to burnout state in the end. And the, the bonus point is you only use your release process once a year. So there's a good chance your release process won't work anymore either. Because, well, things change. Um, and then somebody comes up with a smart fix. We have a feature freeze in the end. Um, which, from talking to people, um, the, the smallest window I've heard of is one month. The largest one I've heard of is six months. Um, what happens? You move your deadline one month earlier. You still have the same arbitrary deadline. Uh, what do you tell your engineers? It's like, oh, you don't need to test your stuff while you're working on it. We will have that feature freeze in the end, and we will do all the testing there. Well, who of you ever tried to write a test case for something you built half a year ago? You probably won't remember half of the edge cases, and that is perfectly normal. Um, so it roughly doesn't change much for the release in the end. Um, it might even be worse for your release because you have way worse test coverage. And well, in addition, you also lose a month to, to, or a month up to six months to react to any external impact. So if your customer comes in last moment, it's like, oh, we, we actually would need to support that additional piece of hardware. The reply might be, oh, we are in feature freeze already, sorry. Customer won't be happy, your engineers won't be happy either. So how do we come up with a real fix for that? Um, well, we just move our releases to daily. Where daily means we release every day. And that is quite a drastic change for many uh, organizations. But it comes with a few benefits. Um, most of all, it's like the more frequent you release, the more uh, the smaller your change sets get. Yes. Um, so within a year, I don't know, you submit a thousand changes. One of those changes, or some combination of changes, might break something. And good luck figuring out which of that change has had the, the bad impact. Whereas if you release daily, you break something. There were, I don't know, five changes with. Uh, 
within your two releases, it's quite easy to figure out which change actually broke it, because most likely the thing that breaks only had one of those five changes impacting. It. Um, the second thing is your release process keeps working, because of course you use it every day and not once a year. And even if it breaks, you lose one day. We can all deal with that. Um, it becomes very easy to include any upstream changes. So I guess you remember that one library that had a huge privacy or security incident and needed to be updated everywhere. And you don't have to come up with one name because there's probably quite a lot of them. Um, well, if you're used to releasing once a year and you suddenly need an emergency release for that, you're also struggling usually. But if your release happens every day, that's quite easy. And the other thing for your internal team is you have a way shorter feedback loop. If I write something today, it breaks tomorrow, I know how to fix it. Can't do that next year. Um, from the non-technical benefits, you take away a lot of pressure from your engineering teams. Um, a lot of engineering, um, life of an engineer is based around getting your, your stuff released. That might be uh, your career depending on it. You won't get promoted if you don't write anything that provides benefit to a company. Uh, we all know it's a quite nice feeling if you meet your friends on the weekend and they tell you about, oh, I found that really nice thing in, in the product for, of the company you're working at. And your answer is, yeah, well, I built that. That's a nice feeling usually. Um, and the other thing is you get way more emphasis on testing. Uh, if you have a choice of missing a release to add a, an extra test case, that is an easy choice to make if I just miss one day for the release. If I miss an entire year for that release, it's quite easy to actually skip that test case because, well, better have the feature than have it tested. Um. And also on the, on the engineering side, I can rely on feedback before the context switch happens for me. Even if I start something new the next day, there's still some fresh memory. I can go back to my work from yesterday, I can fix it. Um, and last but not least, you no longer need to plan your releases. They happen. They happen every day. Um. So roughly what do we need to do for that? The most important thing is split up between a binary release and a feature release, whereas we release our binaries every day. We fully automate that, and that is really the most important part. Automate your releases. Um, it depends on the, the status of your, your organization, how uh, comfortable you are with that. Uh, some people like to still have everything automated and then have somebody look at it if well all the tests are really green uh, check one one checkbox and then continue with that um, and in every release include all upstream changes so any library you depend upon regularly in, uh, include those changes also automate including that changes um, the one thing you want to consider is that creating a release and pushing that release to your production environment or to your customers uh, might not be the same thing. Uh, so especially if you're uh, well bound by working hours and time zones, people really don't like to get paged on the weekends because something broke. So you probably don't want to push a new release on weekends just to keep your, your uh, employees more happy or your coworkers. Um, so try to, to separate pushing it to production or releasing it. And the other thing is you might have customers that don't want to install a new release every day because it doesn't work for them. Um, one nice trick there is uh, mark your daily releases as better release and come up with some time frame where that better gets removed. Like uh, once every two weeks, my customers are happy with installing something new. So every two, two weeks, that release is not a better release, but actually a production release. Uh, and also all the, the app stores, et cetera, usually support that kind of, of release pattern. 
Uh, on the other side, we have uh, feature launches, uh, where we launch a feature when we are sure it's ready to be launched, which means we have some metrics collected. I will have some, some uh, topics there on the next slide. We make sure the feature is working. We have a good idea that the feature will be working. And then we actually turn the feature live. Um, which usually means we don't have a special binary release for that. We just dark launch the features. We include the code in the binary release. But we only activate the code path once we are uh, comfortable with that. So how do we make our life easier by that? And there's a few points we can do. The first thing is we canary our releases. We don't push it everywhere. We push it to a small subset of services. We monitor our services, so we need to have monitoring in place when we want to do canary releases. Because if I don't know if the, the crashing binary is actually the new release or the old release, the canary won't help me. Um, again, all, all the, the app stores provide a similar thing where you can roll out to a subset of uh, users based on location stats or something like that. Um, collect feedback as long as the binary looks good. Increase uh, the rollout. So roughly start with one service, go to two, four, eight, until your entire fleet is updated. Um, second thing, if you build new features, build them around feature toggles. So have something that allows you to turn the feature on and off at any time. Um, one way is to do it with a startup flag for your service. Uh, ideally, you have something that allows you to do that uh, without restarting the service. Um, that way you can also uh, canary release uh, single features by enabling it on a subset of your services um, or even down to enabling it for a certain amount of incoming requests. So independent of which service gets hit, 10% of your uh, incoming requests have a new feature enabled. And well, even if you have good metrics from your canary or experimenting with a new feature before, it might be that your expected use, usage of a new feature is something like 10% of my users will use the new feature and my resources are fine. And then it turns out that feature was a bit better than expected and everybody wants to use it, use it and you run out of compute resources. And you can't scale up fast enough, so you probably just need to shut down the, the new feature because that's always better than shutting down the entire thing. Which brings us to the next point, uh, graceful degradation. Um, don't fail your services unless you really have to. Um, I think the, the most popular implementation of that is with video streaming services, where you might start out with a, with a 4K video and end up with 720p because something along the, or in between you and the, and the service uh, doesn't keep up with the, the bandwidth required. And, well, if you have the choice between you ruining your movie night and seeing slightly less pixels, I guess most of us are happy out with slightly less pixel. Uh, and if you have the feature toggles in place already, the graceful degradation becomes way easier. Uh, next point, backwards compatibility. Um, which is, again, if you have canary releases, you have multiple versions of your binary running. If you have features turned on or off, uh, your clients need to be able to deal with that in one way or the other. So you need to have your APIs backwards compatible. It makes your life easier. It makes everybody else's life easier. Um, and the, the APIs are the one thing, because that is what others see from the outside. That is how your clients see you. And the other thing is make your data formats uh, backward compatible. If you have, um, well, your services have some data that they work with. You usually store that somewhere. And if you need to change the entire data format for, for a new release, there is no way back for you, or no easy way back for you. As long as your data formats are compatible, you can still just switch back. 
and just roll back a broken release. Um, and with a uh, rollback is roughly, we went through all the, the above, uh, turning features off doesn't work out, degrading our service doesn't work out. The next step uh, is just to roll back, which means we take the new binary, take it out of our split, push the new, uh, the, the old release that we know is working. Uh, usually it's like if you're in the state of thinking about a rollback, that's usually a good sign you should roll back. There is no need to uh, figure out what the issue is while the thing is still in production. You have your logs, you have your crash dumps, all those other things. You have your monitoring still from the canary releases. Uh, so once you think about a rollback, roll back as fast as possible. Your customers will be happier because your service is up and running. You will be happier because your service is up and running. And you still have plenty of time to figure out what the issue was offline without having any impact on your customers. Um, the one thing to note for all of these is you might have some limitations in the environment you're working with that won't allow for all of them. Um, for example, canary releases usually use up quite some resources. You not only need to provide enough resources to serve all your uh, queries, you also need enough resources for an additional uh, service to run next to the production side. So instead of 100%, you probably need at least 120%, which means if you're in an, in an uh, IoT environment, for example, you usually don't have that capacity. Um, or I don't know, uh, systems that run in cars, you probably don't have everything redundant there. So you want to be sure that, the, or you can't do the canary release on one unit, you can do it across the entire fleet. Um, and also for all of those things, it's quite easy if you start from scratch, you design your thing around, that is what I want to be capable of, and that is how I want my service to run. If you come into a new job and you see like, oh, we have that thing that we've been developing for the last 10 years and it doesn't support any of that, that will be, well, a hard time getting all of them in there. So with that said, I was talking two minutes faster than anticipated, which means you have more time for questions. Uh, do you have a microphone? Very well. Um, so the question is how do you deal with, with libraries and other upstream dependencies? So yes, ideally you always take the, the latest release, um, which is, it, it, it's easy if the, the library is developed in-house and follows the same schedule as you do. And you know, well, thing, things are tested, you can look at, well, everything they're doing. It's a bit more tricky with, with external dependencies where, I don't know, they might use a different version control system than you, they might use a different um, release process, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the thing we do is we, we include uh, the code from head as often as possible and build everything ourselves. So where do you start if you have pretty much nothing in place except for, for your code and the release process once a year? Um, well, you definitely want to have testing even if you stay on the annual release process, so I would probably start there. Um, then you probably need to build the confidence in your organization to release more often and to trust your releases. Um, so it will not be, well, we will do that next month. It will be a multi-year project for sure. 
Um, and you will for sure have intermediate steps where you know that the things are automated, but you still have a human look at it before you release it. Um, if you really want to do that, uh, plan in quite some, some lifetime for that. And pl uh, plan for a lot of headwind in your organization. Does that answer your question? Yes. What are the implications of testing if you release daily? Like, how is it communicated or how does it work? Um, so what is the, the implication on testing with daily releases? Um, so you have multiple levels of testing. You have unit tests, those are easy to automate. Uh, you have integration tests, they should be just as easy to automate. Um, depending on how long the test case runs. So unit tests, you probably want to have all of them executed uh, pre-submit, so before any change gets into your code base. Um, integration tests, if they run longer, you might only run them uh, post-submit. Uh, and then if you have human testing, you want to get rid of that as much as possible. So that is automate everything. Uh, if you still need human testing for whatever reason, make sure that your testers work as close with your engineers as possible. Because if they know what changed within a day, they know what to test for. If they are like completely separated in, I don't know, different time zones, don't speak the same language, worst case, or something like that, uh, you will probably not make it to a daily release on that setup. Yes, there needs there needs to be tight coupling, and there need to be there needs to be uh, communication between the two teams. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, how does the typical developer workflow work? Do you see it as, uh, as an additional step after? going to, uh, I don't know, having a continuous integration system and then at the point of production releases, you can releases, or do you see that the basic that you work for? Um, so the question is if, if daily releases replace continuous integration? Did I understand that correctly? I want to I know because you said you talked about teacher moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so so you really you you never submit your code for the new feature to the main branch before you you are happy with the feature on your feature branch. Is that the model you're you're doing right now? I mean, so, so roughly with daily releases, you don't have any feature branches anymore. You commit everything into the, the one major branch, main branch, and you release the binary from there. And with feature toggles, is it's just, I don't know, you, you have an if case around your, your entire feature, and as long as that doesn't evaluate to true, you don't execute that feature in production. So yeah, you, don't, you no longer need the feature branch you just toggle the feature in your main branch as you need. Yes? Just a comment on that, which can be a huge uh, thing because some features are uh, change so much of the code that you have a very big if um, Uh, Just a comment, sorry. Well, yes, it could be one large, it could be multiple locations. So yeah, well, if, it also helps if you don't have huge monolithic applications. And I think we are out of time. Or one minute. Okay, one minute for questions. There's no more questions then. Thank you for your attention.